David Sinclair, professor of genetics at Harvard Medical School and co-founder of Animal Bioscience, quote, I am very proud of the teams at NCSU and Animal Biosciences who after years of collaborative research and a clinical trial have developed the first supplement proven to reverse aging in dogs. We are sort of at a critical time in the longevity community. Misinformation and dishonesty is sort of running rampant. I think there are really three challenges right now with natural product senolytics. My name is Matt Caberlein, and welcome to the OptiSpan YouTube channel. Hey everyone, welcome to the OptiSpan podcast. On this episode of Longevity This Week, we're going to cover a story that has gotten a lot of attention in the longevity community recently. And that's at least in part because of a public stand I took against some claims made in a press release from a company called Animal Biosciences. So we're going to do this episode in a two-parter. In part one, I'll talk generally about the specific product being marketed by Animal Biosciences and my personal recommendation for pet owners who may be wondering whether to give this to their dogs or not. And then in part two, I'll do a deeper dive into the science behind this product, what we know, and specifically a preprint that um, came out recently that the company is using to justify some of their claims around this product. So what I'm not going to do is go into the details of the events that led to my public resignation from the Academy for Health and Lifespan Research. For those of you who are interested, um, it's all in the public domain. I made a statement uh, posted to my LinkedIn and Twitter feeds. Um, you're certainly welcome to go and read that statement if you want to. Um, I do believe we are sort of at a critical time in the longevity community where it feels like misinformation and dishonesty is sort of running rampant. Um, and I would say we really need ethical, credible leaders who can be trusted to tell the truth, even when it's painful and comes at personal expense. Um, okay, so... The press release was put out on February 29th, a few hours just after a preprint from Dr. Natasha Olby at North Carolina State had been posted to the preprint server BioArchive. Um, I'll do a deep dive on the preprint in part two. For now, I want to provide a bit of context about BioArchive. BioArchive is a preprint server that serves as a platform to researchers to share their findings informally before they publish in scientific journals. A preprint can really be thought of as a preliminary version of a scientific manuscript. That means that it's a full research paper, but is essentially a draft version that hasn't been examined by experts to ensure that the paper's methodology is sound and its results are credible. Preprints have some great benefits. They allow researchers to share their findings with the scientific community, which helps others build upon these findings, identify flaws or oversights, and give feedback faster. They're also publicly available, unlike many published papers, which get stuck behind journal paywalls. But that public availability comes with some challenges, especially in cases where flawed research may become amplified and disseminated to a public that's not equipped to evaluate it. It's crucial to recognize that because papers on BioArchive have not yet undergone any rigorous scrutiny or peer review, we should approach preprints with a healthy dose of caution and skepticism. Peer review is a quality control mechanism that helps weed out errors, biases, and unsubstantiated claims from research that enters the public domain. I certainly don't want to suggest that peer review is perfect. It's not. But stuff on BioArchive and other preprint servers hasn't even gone through that level of quality control. So when a company makes claims about clinical proof in a press release based solely on a preprint, you really have to kind of take it with a grain of salt. And there are a few claims in this press release that I find particularly problematic. The first claim is that this study, and they're referring to the preprint from Dr. Olby, this study shows the first clinical evidence that it is possible to reverse age-related decline in dogs. So really, in my view, there's two reasons that statement is problematic. Um, first, as I'll describe in part two of this video, there's no solid evidence in the preprint that the animal bioscience product reverses age-related decline in dogs. And second, there's actually several peer-reviewed studies that have shown 
in my opinion, far more impressive improvements in age-related measures in dogs. There are actually a couple of papers reporting lifespan extension in dogs from the FDA-approved L. Deprenal. So the Deprenal studies, much like the caloric restriction studies that have been done in dogs, were carried out in laboratory dogs maintained in the laboratory, which obviously is very different from companion animals living with their owners. Nonetheless, the point really is that even if there had been positive effects from the clinical trial, it would hardly be the first time that, that, that that's been shown. And I say that simply to make the point that we need to be careful not to overhype uh, what I would characterize as very preliminary results suggestive of an impact on aging. Okay, so the second claim in the press release that I found troubling was the statement, and this is a quote, the formula formulation may have broader effects on frailty, activity, and happiness as assessed by owners. And so I think if we, if we want to be generous, we could say the word may in there really prevents this from being an outright falsehood. But the preprint specifically did not find any statistically significant improvements in frailty, activity, or happiness, even though they tried really hard to look for it. So when a clinical trial explicitly says they did not find evidence for something, it seems a bit misleading to then claim in the press release that there was evidence for that. And unfortunately, further down in the press release, they sort of doubled down on this statement and say, and again, this is a quote, in senior dogs, as in humans, this age-related decline can manifest as cognitive decline, increased frailty, and lower engagement. The results of the trial showed positive impacts in all of these areas. Okay, again, the results of the trial explicitly did not show statistically significant positive impacts in any of these areas of decline. Um, and so, you know, I think it's it's fair to say that that statement in the press release simply is not true. Um, and of course, the quote that I found most egregious and precipitated my public pushback was from uh, David Sinclair, professor of genetics at Harvard Medical School and co-founder of Animal Bioscience. He stated, quote, I am very proud of the teams at NCSU and Animal Biosciences who, after years of collaborative research and a clinical trial, have developed the first supplement proven to reverse aging in dogs. This, again, is not true. Um, several days later, after some mounting pressure, the company did revise the press release, that specific statement in the press release to read, quote, reverse the effects of age-related decline um, instead of reversing aging. Again, while that's, in my view, less ridiculous language, the preprint does not, in fact, show this. So, so I personally was very concerned by the press release and some of the statements in there that did not actually match what was in the preprint. Okay, so what I want to do for the rest of this episode is talk about this product and uh, what we know, what we don't know, and my personal feelings on whether or not it is um, ready to be marketed to pet owners. So first of all, Animal Biosciences is a company. Uh, it was started by David Sinclair, again, a professor at Harvard, and his brother Nick to sell nutritional supplements to pet owners. And their stated goal is to slow aging at the cellular level to extend the health and vitality of your best friend. So I want to start by saying that this is a noble goal, and it's absolutely one that I support wholeheartedly. Um, as many of you know, I started the Dog Aging Project along with Daniel Promislow and Kate Creevy, you know, more than 10 years ago now, really with a similar vision to understand the biology of aging in pet dogs and to be able to modulate that biology of, to increase health span and hopefully lifespan as well. So again, I'm 100% supportive of approaches that are being taken to have a positive impact on health span and lifespan in dogs. And honestly, one of my favorite things to have seen over the last several years are companies like Loyal and Epiterna and Trivium Vet and others moving this vision forward with real science. So I absolutely believe that it is possible to delay biological aging in dogs and cats and other animals, just like I believe that it's possible in humans in order to increase lifespan and health span. I also believe that there are likely 
nutritional supplements out there that can do this. We already know that there are molecules that can have these effects in laboratory animals, and it seems almost certain that they can have similar effects in animals living in the real world. Um, and I think we should be testing these things in responsible and scientifically credible ways. So the product here is something called Leap Years, and that's a great name. Uh, and the company claims on it, their website that it is clinically proven to slow effects of aging in dogs. So again, as I've sort of already alluded to, unless there's additional data in the public domain that I'm not aware of, that statement appears to be untrue. So what is Leap Years? Uh, according to the company, Leap Years is a combination of an NAD booster and a senolytic. So I wasn't able to find on the website what specific molecules are in leap years beyond an NAD booster and a senolytic. And as I'll discuss in part two of this video, they don't actually list the ingredients in the preprint, which is kind of weird to do a clinical trial and not actually tell people what was tested in the clinical trial. Um, I have also never seen the product label. I'm going to assume that on the product label, it does in fact say what the molecules are that are in leap years. Um, but I, I don't know because I haven't seen it. I would say given that the product is already being sold and assuming the company isn't doing something in violation of the law, we can guess that the components are what are known as generally recognized as safe or grass compounds that can be put into nutritional supplements and marketed. Um, the only other piece of information I have is that David Sinclair has said that the NAD booster component of leap years is not nicotinamide mononucleotide. So the company is claiming that the molecules in leap years are able to, one, raise NAD levels, that's the NAD booster part, and two, clear senescent cells, that's the senolytic part, in dogs. And again, as far as I know, there is no data in the public domain, at least, supporting this claim. But let's just assume for a minute that that's true. And I mean, that's kind of important, right? That you know that your product is actually doing what you claim that it's doing. So let's just assume that that's the case. Um, and in fact, this product is successfully raising NAD levels and clearing senescent cells in dogs. I think then the next question becomes, would this be a good thing for the health of the dogs? Would we expect it to have a positive impact on aging? And certainly I think there's evidence to support that, but there's also evidence that maybe runs counter to that. So I'd put that in the sort of decidedly maybe bucket. So let's start with the senolytic. Whatever, whatever compound that might be, um, a senolytic refers to an intervention that specifically targets and clears senescent cells. And by clears, I mean kills senescent cells. So if you watched uh, the video on this channel on the hallmarks of aging, you will recognize cellular senescence as one of the hallmarks of aging. As a consequence of cellular senescence, our bodies build up an accumulation of these senescent cells. And um, there's a reasonably large body of literature reporting benefits in mice from clearing senescent cells, from getting rid of those senescent cells. And so those benefits range from smallish lifespan effects to a variety of improved health span metrics. So I think certainly we can suggest that based on laboratory studies, there's reason to believe that if you could specifically and effectively clear senescent cells, that is likely to have positive benefits on health span metrics and maybe even on lifespan. So most of those studies that are convincing in laboratory animals have been accomplished using genetic tricks to clear senescent cells. There are a number of molecules that have been proposed to be what are called senolytic molecules that can specifically target and clear senescent cells. And some of those are natural products. Those include things like quercetin, fisetin, berberin, and even our old friend resveratrol. Again, we don't know if one of those is the component of leap years or a different natural product molecule is, is the supposed senolytic in leap years. Um, but let's just assume it's one of the, the natural products that has been reported to have some senolytic activity. So at very high doses, these molecules like fisidin and berberin and quercetin will in fact kill senescent cells in a Petri dish. However, the data supporting their senolytic activity in vivo, and by that I mean in a whole animal, is I would say generally pretty weak. Um, in fact, several of the initial reports suggesting lifespan and healthspan benefits 
from senolytic natural product molecules have proven not to be reproducible, or I think at a minimum, we can say they've been inconsistent across different laboratories. So even in mice, it's a little bit questionable whether these natural product compounds are actually useful senolytics and are beneficial in the context of aging. This is even more true for dogs. Research on senolytics in dogs is still very much in its infancy, and as far as I know, we have no real evidence for any molecule acting as a true senolytic in dogs or for the effects of senolytics on age-related diseases and pathologies in dogs. The field also needs to do more research to evaluate the long-term safety and potential side effects of senolytic use in dogs. There's still so much we don't know. I think there are really three challenges right now with natural product senolytics. Um, the first challenge is around bioavailability. So most of these natural product senolytic or putative senolytics um, really have very poor bioavailability, meaning it's difficult to get enough of these molecules in circulation or into tissues and cells to actually have the senolytic activity. And I think resveratrol is a classic case of uh, a natural product with very poor bioavailability. Um, the second problem is that all of these natural products are what we call dirty drugs. And what I mean by that is they're nonspecific. So um, almost all of these molecules, probably all of them have dozens to hundreds, maybe even thousands of proteins that they interact with inside of our cells. And often they will interact with these off-target proteins at doses far lower than the amount needed to achieve senolytic activity. So what that means is you're, you get a lot of off-target effects that certainly could have either, either positive or negative consequences in the context of aging, but really have nothing to do with the target activity, which in this case is senolysis or clearing of senescent cells. And then I think the third problem, and this is true of all senolytic strategies so far, is they are nonspecific, meaning even if you can actually achieve cytotoxic, and that word means cell killing, even if you can actually achieve cytotoxic levels of these natural product senolytics in cells and tissues, um, this is not going to be 100% specific for senescent cells. So you end up killing normal functioning cells as well. And so again, I think there are some concerns around non-specificity that can lead to potential problems in addition to the potential benefits you might get from targeting senescent cells. And so again, we don't know what the molecule is that is in leap years, but unless it's something new, more potent and more specific than the current crop, there's not much reason to believe it's a true senolytic in dogs, and likely there is no direct evidence for senolytic activity in dogs. So what about the NAD booster part? So NAD is a cofactor involved in hundreds of different metabolic reactions, and this is true in every cell that we know of. And it's become a popular idea in the field that NAD levels decline with age, and therefore that a booster will restore NAD levels to youthful levels and potentially improve metabolic health in doing so. Um, so the literature on NAD boosters and laboratory studies is also mixed, probably even more mixed than the senolytic literature, with some studies reporting positive effects on health span metrics, others failing to replicate these effects. Um, the highest quality lifespan study to date on an NAD booster was carried out by the National Institute on Aging Interventions Testing Program. They tested nicotinamide riboside, one of the two most commonly talked about NAD boosters, nicotinamide mononucleotide being the other one. We can believe that the leap years product does not have nicotinamide mononucleotide in it, so perhaps it's nicotinamide riboside. Regardless, the ITP study showed no lifespan effect from nicotinamide riboside in mice. Um, and I think the question even of whether or not NAD levels consistently decline with age across a variety of tissues is a pretty open question in the field right now. In fact, a recent comprehensive review, um, which in my opinion aligns very well with the consensus among experts in the field, basically concluded that the evidence supporting the idea that NAD generally declines with age is, is pretty weak. In fact, uh, they said, quote, we find that despite systematic claims of overall changes in NAD levels with aging, the evidence to support such claims is very limited and often restricted to a single tissue or cell type. This is particularly true in humans where the development of NAD levels during aging is still poorly characterized. 
Um, and I would say if that's true in humans, there's even less data in dogs. In fact, I'm not aware of any published data in dogs suggesting or showing a decline in NAD levels with age at all, let alone, broadly speaking, across multiple tissues and organs. So it's a pretty weak thesis at this point that NAD levels decline with age in dogs and therefore boosting NAD levels will have a benefit in dogs. And I would say much more concerning to me is some still unpublished data that has been presented at several conferences reporting kidney damage in aged mice treated with the NAD booster nicotinamide mononucleotide. And this was specifically in aged mice and it was specifically using NMN or nicotinamide mononucleotide. So we don't know whether or not those effects would be seen with other NAD boosters, but it's sufficiently concerning, especially in an animal like dogs, where we know that kidney disease is a pretty significant health concern with aging, that I'd wanna be very, very sure that providing an NAD booster and, and achieving high levels of NAD in aged dogs is not going to exacerbate kidney pathology. So again, it's really only one study, not yet peer reviewed, not yet published. So I don't wanna overstate the situation other than I think most people when it comes to their pets um, would wanna be extremely cautious and know with high confidence that whatever product they are providing to their pets is not going to exacerbate or induce kidney disease or other age-related problems in their animals. So as far as I know, the animal bioscience has not provided any data one way or the other on the effects of their product on kidney function in aged dogs. So the take home for all of this is that personally, I would not give this supplement to my dog. Um, I personally think it's unlikely at this point to have any real benefits, or at least there are enough questions around what's in the product and the limited data that's available to um, suggest that we really don't know if there are likely to be any benefits. Um, and again, I think there are really significant unanswered questions around the composition of the product, the safety of the product, and the efficacy of the product. And so I realize that, you know, this is, has been a pretty negative, I guess, um, review of their product. Uh, and I do want to say, I want to give credit to the team at Animal Biosciences for even engaging in a clinical trial at all. Um, obviously, they aren't obligated to do that under the current FDA rules. Um, so I think I think that's good. I would like to see more supplement companies actually invest in testing their products in rigorous clinical trials. Having said that, it really doesn't feel like they are rigorously interpreting the results of this study. So um, if you want to understand specifically what was done and what those results are, I encourage you to tune into part two of this episode where I'll do a deep dive into the clinical trial and the data that came out of it. So I hope you found this episode interesting and informative. As always, if you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. And I hope to see you next time on the OptiSpan podcast.